if you would, uh, please point your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Luke, chapter 4. It is my honor and privilege to be with you today in God's holy and inerrant Word. Thankful to be here. We're going to pick up where we left off, Luke chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the, in the pew in front of you. And if you're not super familiar with the Bible, Luke chapter 4 is found towards the back of the Bible. In the black Bible, that's page 859. Just look for the big four. I'll be reading from verse 1 down to verse 13. And then I'll pray for the Lord's help on our time together. And then we'll get to work in this passage. Total should be around 45 minutes or so. Luke chapter 4 beginning at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Would you pray with me? Father Jesus said, your word is truth. Give us eyes to see the beauties of Jesus here in the truthful word. Feed us this morning from your word and nourish us. To the weary, may they find strength here. To the beleaguered, may they find encouragement. To the comfortable, may they be afflicted. And to the afflicted, may they find comfort. In this, your holy and inerrant word, write it now upon our hearts. For Jesus' sake we ask. God's people said amen. It was probably October of 1527 when an overweight German monk sat down with Psalm 46 in front of him and he penned words that he intended to turn into a song that his church would sing. He wrote, Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing. We're not the right man of God on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His name. From age to age the same, and He must win the battle. Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is our God became known as the battle hymn of the Reformation. It was sung in churches and in streets, sung by the poor, even by martyrs on their way to death. 
The meter of that song is rugged and driving, a bit like Luther himself. And its message has comforted Christians for nearly 500 years. Martin Luther personally knew of the believer's constant need to find God as their refuge, as their fortress against the world and the flesh and the devil. Because not many years prior, the German monk was condemned by Pope Leo X. And he was commanded to renounce his belief that salvation from God came by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And for Luther's constant insistence upon the authority of Scripture alone. In 1521, he was summoned to a council that was convened by the Holy Roman Emperor himself. And there, Luther was asked to renounce all of his writings and to submit himself to the authority of the Pope and to the Roman Church. Well, he took a day to pray about it, consulted with some friends. And on the next day, April 18th, Luther gave his now famous reply. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So, dear Christian, when you, like Luther, are facing opposition and persecution, temptation, you must find, as Luther did, a mighty fortress is our God. We've come to one of the better known events in the life of the Lord Jesus, the temptation in the wilderness. And this passage, Luke chapter 4, is connected with, with, with everything that has come before Luke 4. If you were with us last Lord's Day, you remember chapter 3 ended with the Lord's genealogy, ended on these words, the son of Adam, the son of God. And interestingly, chapter 4 opens with a testing of those very things. Luke seeks to put Jesus forth as the new and better Adam, as the new and better Israel in the wilderness, facing a temptation of his own. But unlike Israel, he will come out victorious. Luke endeavors to put Jesus forth as our representative as our refuge, so that when God's people face opposition and temptation in their own lives, to Jesus they must turn. A mighty fortress is our God. Here's the big idea this morning. It's really a simple one. Because Jesus Christ said no to the devil, God's people can say yes to God. Because Jesus Christ said no to the devil, God's people can say yes to God. We'll work our way through the passage a little bit at a time. We'll start in verses 1 and 2 again, and we'll see Jesus Christ driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So let's read verses 1 and 2 uh, one more time. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is led by the Holy Spirit. Luke's gospel has been sometimes called the gospel of the Holy Spirit. And this is because Luke unveils the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, more than the other gospel writers. The Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead, is a very active person in this gospel. And he's been very active from the very beginning of this gospel. You'll remember that he filled the life of John the Baptist. You'll remember that the Holy Spirit was present and there at the incarnation of Jesus in Mary's womb. 
You'll remember that the Holy Spirit is bringing joy to those who are involved in the work of God, pointing them to Christ. And you'll remember from just a couple of weeks ago that it was the Holy Spirit who descended upon the Lord Jesus at His baptism in the River Jordan. And notice in verse 1, Luke is calling us back to the Jordan by mentioning it here for reasons that will become evident, I trust, in a moment. But notice, it is the Holy Spirit who is leading the Lord Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I wonder if I should point out the obvious, which is that you, dear Christian, could be in the very center of God's will for your life, being led by God the Holy Spirit Himself, and find yourself in a desert, weak and facing temptation. It seems to me that some of us have an idea that following God the Holy Spirit in our life leads us beside still waters only, as if that's the only path the Holy Spirit knows, as if that's the only place where we can grow. And of course, God the Holy Spirit does lead us beside still waters, and we thank God when He does that. But even in the peaceful waters of Psalm 23, come while you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, where evil and enemies surround. Of course, the Lord Jesus does not hide the terms and conditions of following Him. Later in Luke chapter 9 and chapter 14, we're going to read, Lord willing, Jesus telling us the terms and conditions of following Him. Jesus said this, and I quote, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus even said this, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it memorably that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So friend, if you don't find yourself regularly having to say no to things that you deeply desire, if following Jesus doesn't at times feel like you're going to die, I just wonder whether you're following Jesus at all. To follow God, the Holy Spirit, means that at times you will find yourself in the wilderness and weak and facing temptations and trials and testing. But this is where we learn to trust Him. This is where faith becomes active. Another obvious point. And it is one that I suppose needs to be made in our day, which is that there is a devil. There is a devil, and he is a real being, a created being, not just a force of evil. He speaks, as we have seen, but also, also he is subservient to God. He serves God's purposes. And as those who have been united to Jesus Christ, we needn't fear the devil. There's that memorable line from Luther's hymn where he says, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. Luke tells us that Jesus returned from the Jordan, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted for 40 days. Now, any student of the Bible should pick up on the connection of Jordan, wilderness, 40 years, 40 days, testing. Of course, it makes you think of Israel in the wilderness. God delivered His covenant people out of slavery in Egypt, where they went into the wilderness and spent 40 years being tested. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Moses said, Remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that He might humble you, testing you 
to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You see, Luke is presenting Jesus as the true Israel who went into the wilderness to be tested. But as I said earlier, unlike Israel, Jesus will keep God's commandments and he will pass the test. Luke says that Jesus ate nothing for 40 days and he was hungry. It speaks to his humanity. When the enemy strikes, while wow, the Lord Jesus is weak and hungry. Let's pick up reading in verse 3. Jesus being tempted by the devil. This is verses 3 and 4. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Notice the enemy begins his temptation with the question surrounding Jesus' identity. It's interesting, isn't it? If you are the Son of God, he'll do this twice. But you see what he's doing, don't you? He's doing the same thing he has always done. He's questioning God's Word. Back in chapter 3, when Jesus was in the River Jordan, being baptized, you remember God the Father spoke from heaven. What did he say? You are my beloved son. And into those same sinless ears, the enemy's forked tongue whispers, yeah, but are you really? He might as well have said, did God actually say? If you are the Son of God, we'll turn this stone into bread. If you really are God's Son, then He wouldn't hold out on you. He wouldn't want you to suffer with hunger, would He? If you are truly His Son, it seems to me that God is holding out on you. You know, it's the very same thing He said to Adam and Eve in the garden, isn't it? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve, to her credit, says, no, God told us that we can eat from any tree in the garden, just not the one in the midst of the garden, lest we die. But you see the enemy's tactic here, don't you? It is always the same. You can't believe what God has said. God is holding out on you. He knows that if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened, you'll become like God, and you will know good from evil. The enemy is always seeking to convince God's people not to trust in God's commands. Because God's commands are meant to withhold something from them. But beloved, we must not fall into the devil's trap. God's commands are good. When God puts restrictions on your life, it is because God intends to give. And so he'll tell us, keep yourself from premarital sex because I have something better for you. Keep yourself from same-sex attraction because I have something better for you. Don't flee from your marriage when things get difficult. I have something better for you. Be honest in your business dealings, even when it's costly, because I have something better for you. See, so don't believe the enemy's lie. When God withholds, it is for our good, and because he intends to give us something better than anything that is promised by sin. Well, you guys know the story. Adam and Eve ultimately failed their test in the garden. They believed the devil's lie. They believed that God was holding out on them, and they ate, and sin came into the world. How different Adam's temptation from the Lord Jesus' temptation. Just think about it for a moment. Adam was tempted in a garden. 
Jesus was tempted in a wilderness. Adam was tempted in a world without sin or death. But in Jesus' world, he was surrounded by sin and death. Adam was with his wife, and Jesus is all alone. Adam was being tempted with a full belly, whereas the Lord Jesus, as we read, was hungry. Jesus is the true and better Adam. So the enemy questions God's word, and Jesus answers the enemy's temptation with God's word. Verse 4, it is written. How interesting. The first words the Messiah speaks after beginning his ministry is a quotation of the Bible. He's telling the devil, your tactics won't work with me. I know what my father has said. I believe what my father has said. I stand on what my father has said. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone. And the context of that verse is to remind Israel of how the Lord would provide for them in the wilderness. The full verse is this. This is Moses speaking again. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, the Lord is teaching his people in the wilderness that he will let them go hungry so that in fulfillment of his promise to them, he would feed them himself and they would learn to trust his word that He would be their provider. He would teach them that their life as His people was more than just food and the acquisition of physical comforts. They must learn to trust more in what God has said than in what they see. or perhaps more relevant to us today, we must learn to trust more in what God has said than in what we feel. We must learn to live by and depend upon God's promises. Facing this temptation in the wilderness, Jesus stands in the place of all who question God's provision. He stands in your place, church, every time you wonder whether God will be faithful to provide. And Jesus tells the enemy, no, I am the Son of God. My Father will provide for me. He is my life. He is my portion. He is my bread. My food is to do His will. And as the Son of God, of course, Jesus could have turned the stone into raisin bran. He had that power. But never once would Jesus use his divinity to alleviate the suffering of his humanity. He is the son of Adam. He is the son of God. And he would come into his glory in the way his father had willed and in no other way which is the subject of the next temptation. Let's keep reading. Verse 5, down to verse 8. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. To hear the devil is offering the Lord a shortcut, isn't he? All the kingdoms of this world, all the glory, all the authority, you can have it, and you can bypass the suffering to get it. 
bypass the cross, bypass the suffering, bow down to me, and it's all yours. The devil says that the authority and glory of the nations belongs to him. And you might be wondering, is that true? Well, John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus calls him the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4, he's called the God of this world. 1 John chapter 5, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So yes, it is true. Otherwise, this temptation would have been meaningless. But it's only half true. Satan, as I mentioned earlier, is still under the sovereign control of Almighty God. For Jesus of Nazareth to have bowed the knee to the devil would have meant renouncing God as his Father. And our Master and Savior could not and would not be won by the enemy's offer of a crown without a cross. He will come to his crown in the way that had been prescribed for him by his Father. Jesus knew his Father was good. And he knows that he will suffer unimaginably, but he will do so in his Father's will, according to his Father's pleasure, and to redeem sinners from their sin. And so Jesus replies to this temptation with another quotation, again from Deuteronomy, this time chapter 6, verse 13, where he says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Jesus knew that his authority, his status, his glory would come to him as the king of kings from his father. And so Jesus' allegiance would remain with him. God had willed that his son would suffer abandonment and agony and the shame of of the sins of mankind. And although Jesus was sinless himself, he laid down his life as the substitute of those who've committed sin. Those people who did uh, deserve to be abandoned and suffer agony and have the shame of their sin exposed. And Jesus did this in submission to his Father's will. And he would take no shortcut. He would walk the path that had been laid out by his Father. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, I'm glad that you're here. And I'm wondering whether you know the reason why Jesus died. Well, it was for this. In God's love for sinners like you, those who had turned their back on him, rejected his authority, God the Father put forth His own Son in their place for their sin. And when you turn from your sin and to the Lord, God will be pleased to accept you by Jesus' own sacrifice in your place, that Jesus paid the penalty that you deserve to pay, and that your sins, which deserve God's judgment, can be forgiven because of Jesus. Friend, before you leave this place today, ask someone about this. Ask them to tell you the story of their own life and how God has been merciful to them. These are my friends. I know that they'd be delighted to meet with you, to talk with you, and to show you how you can see the faithfulness of God in forgiving sinners just like them. Jesus Christ stands in the place of all who doubt God's ways. Each of us who are tempted to take the easy route, to give our allegiance to the enemy in order to avoid suffering and difficulty. He stands in the place of all who question God's timing, which to our minds is often painfully slow. Jesus stands in the place of those who have given their allegiance to some other Lord, some other God. 
be it career, be it finances, or any number of things. Jesus Christ gives victory to all who are tempted to offer their allegiance to a substance with the promise of escaping the difficulties of life in a fallen world. Jesus Christ stands in the place of all who are tempted to leave their spouse for the promise of something better. Jesus resisted the devil. He trusted that his Father would give him the status and the glory and the authority. He knew that all good things come from his Father. And if they would come to him, and they would, they would come in the way that God had willed. And the way God had willed was the cross. His allegiance would remain with his Father. And aren't you glad? Let's keep reading. Verses 9 to 12, the third temptation. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here the offer is, shine, Jesus. Show the world that you are the Son of God. Throw yourself down. The angels will catch you. Everyone will see it. And you'll get to glory. And so the devil takes... Jesus to the pinnacle, to the highest point of the most important place in the world, and it says, throw yourself down. Show everyone who you truly are, Jesus, Son of God. There's a high point on the temple called the Royal Perch, which sits above the Kidron Valley. A fall would have been 450 feet. And so it could be that the enemy is telling Jesus, throw yourself over here. A fall from here would have been deadly. God will catch you. God will be prom he will keep his promise. He'll send angels. They'll catch you. And everyone will see it. This is what the devil is saying. That if God is really with you, if he really is your father, and you really are his son, then prove it. Show everyone. Throw yourself off the edge. Make God be faithful to his promise. Notice the devil even quotes the Bible here. Psalm 91. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hands. They will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And just so you know, the devil's quotation of Psalm 91 is not out of context. It's exactly what it says. But it is misapplied. This promise of God, which he gave to his people, along with all the promises of God, are not license to put yourself in a situation where God is forced to act in order to prove that he is faithful. That's not how God's promises work. And so that's why Jesus responds from, again, Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, God tests his people. We don't test him. This passage that Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 refers back to a time in Israel where they were being tested. They were testing the Lord in a place that was eventually to be called Massa. If you remember this section of Scripture, they, were, they weren't very long in the wilderness before they got thirsty. They began to grumble and complain against Moses and demand that God would give them something to drink. They even said things like, why did you bring us out here? Is God with us or is he not with us? Prove it, God. That is a dangerous attitude. Do you see how that puts us in the center? And makes God 
have to prove himself to us, makes God serve our needs in order to prove himself. And yes, it is true that God has promised that he would meet his people's needs, he will protect his people, but God will do it in his way, on his terms, in his timing. And no creature has a right to put themselves in a situation where God is forced to care for them. God is not a genie and a lamp that we rub with faith. So you don't throw yourself off a cliff just to make God catch you. So everyone will see how amazing your faith is and how God will always be faithful to you. And so the Lord of glory would not come into His own by forcing His Father to act. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus did not count equality with God something to be grasped, taken by force, but instead He emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. You understand that a servant makes no demands upon his master, and Jesus took the form of a servant. The Lord Jesus stands in the place of all who are tempted to grasp power and position for themselves, forcing God to act on their faith. He stands in the place of all who will treat God as if He were some kind of genie to grant wishes. Jesus stands in the place of those who want to be in authority but never under authority. He stands in the place of the one who demands healing or blessing, as if God can be commanded like a, a trained dog. Jesus stands in my place for every time that I'm not being patient and trusting in God's timing, every time I'm trying to force God into my timeline. Jesus and like me, trust the Lord and the Lord's timing and the Lord's way. And he will submit himself to his Father and trust his Father's will. He will trust that his Father's way is the right way, the best way. And the Lord will not act in any self-serving way. And although he had the power to, Jesus never did a single miracle for his own sake, but always to the glory of the Father and for the betterment of others. Verse 13, this is where we'll land. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus Christ overcame where Adam was overcome. Jesus submitted to God when Adam succumbed to the devil. And as God's son, he trusted that his father would provide. He trusted his father's way. He trusted his father's timing. Jesus Christ is our representative. He stands in our place when we find ourselves tempted by the world and the flesh and the devil. And so church, when you find yourself led by the Spirit into a wilderness of your own, when you find yourself weak and alone, turn to Jesus. His victory over the devil has been granted to you. Because Jesus defeated the enemy in the wilderness and on the cross, all who have been united to Him in faith receive His victory in their life. Jesus said no to the devil so that you, Pickwick Baptist and Cornerstone, can say yes to God. Notice the enemy left Jesus until an opportune time. The enemy will strike at an opportune time. This week, friends, when your guard is down, when you're feeling weak, when you're feeling alone, 
he will call into question God's word and God's goodness at a time probably when you feel it the least. And when he does, remember Jesus. The devil is a defeated foe. The Lord Jesus has stripped him of his power. And what this means is that all of you who are in Christ have victory over the devil, over sin, over temptation. That you can say no to the devil because Jesus did it for you. That you can say no to the flesh because Jesus did it for you. You can say no to the world because Jesus did it for you. And you can say yes to God because Jesus did it for you. Dear Christian brother and sister, you have the spirit of the living God dwelling in you. There is nothing God can command of you to which you reply, I can't. Oh, beloved, yes, you can. Of course you can. Jesus did, and so you can. When you're tempted this week to question God's word and to question God's goodness, turn to Jesus. He went into the wilderness for you. He defeated every temptation for you. He secured victory on your behalf. Remember him and keep God's commandments. And don't forget, every one of those commandments is for your good. Not to take anything, but to give something better. Look to Jesus and get that something better. How did Martin Luther put it again? Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? You know the answer, Christ Jesus, it is he. Please stand for the prayer of confession. Father in heaven, we confess that like our father Adam, we have succumbed to the devil's ploys. We have questioned your word and your goodness. We've treated your commandments as if they were taking something from us rather than giving to us. Will you please forgive us? And Lord, will you forgive us, your people, every time we've broken your word in order to avoid difficulty. Forgive us every lie we've spoken, every commitment we've abandoned, every misleading story that paints us in a better light than we deserve. Lord, will you forgive us for not trusting you, for insisting upon our own way, for considering ourselves better than others rather than servants of others? Lord, will you forgive us for relying on our own strength in this fight and not on your Son? And will you, in your mercy and grace, enable us this week to turn to Jesus and to trust him? Holy Spirit, lead us and grant to us the victory of Christ and give grace as we serve the Lord in humility and with patience and in obedience so that in all things, Jesus would get the credit he so richly deserves. We ask this in his name. Amen. Well, today your assurance of pardon, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where we read this promise. That if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.